7 a.m. Monday on a freeway in Los Angeles. A driver makes a last second dash for the exit ramp, cutting across three or four lanes of traffic. Two cars have to brake really hard to avoid hitting him. This causes a tailback, a chain reaction of braking until 20 cars behind, somebody perhaps not paying attention or tailgating or both, rear ends the vehicle in front. Nobody is hurt, but the two vehicles roll to a halt and the vehicles in the lane behind also grind to a halt as well. Then they try to peel off to the lane to the left to the right to get around the obstacle. And before we know it, like an arterial thrombosis, we have a two-mile tailback and one of those SIG alerts that we dread hearing on our morning commute. Unfortunately, I am at the back of that two-mile tailback. I'm on my way to LAX airport for a flight to the Bay Area for a business meeting. And now I'm really stressed. I'm in danger of missing my flight. There's nothing I can do about it. I just sit there, grind my teeth, and hope that I'm going to get to the airport in time. Eventually I do get to the airport, where I have to leave my car in a dingy parking lot, take a smelly elevator down to the ground floor, where with some difficulty I clamber up into an archaic shuttle bus, which takes me to the chaos of the airport terminal. And I'm not even going to show you the inhumanity and suffering that goes on through check-in, security, and then elbowing my way onto a crowded airplane, because I'm sure you are only too familiar with it yourselves. Needless to say, when we land at the other end and I check out my, uh, my rental car, it's back into the slow, crawling grind of freeway traffic again, only this time in the Bay Area. <laughs> Eventually, I do get to my appointment on time, but I'm tired, I'm stressed, and frankly, I don't really feel like doing business anymore. So this sounds like chaos theory. Well, it is. And we need to banish chaos theory from our transportation. It's too stressful, it's too uncertain, and it's 2015, we really need to do a much better job than we are. And here's another reason why we need to do a better job of our future transportation. This planet of ours, Earth, is this wonderful, amazing, beautiful, self-organizing, self-balancing ecosystem. And in the last few hundred years alone, mankind has succeeded in dangerously unbalancing this system to the point where our very existence is under threat. This is the real reason why we need to radically rethink and remap our transportation systems. But we are on the cusp, cusp of exciting developments. Technology is rapidly bringing us automation to our transportation, our trains, our trucks, and our automobiles. And automation has the possibility of removing chaos from our transportation by removing that unpredictable human element. If we look at the jigsaw puzzle of transportation that we have today, there are clearly some missing pieces. And I have spent my career professionally and in my teaching trying to identify what those missing pieces are. And I've come to the conclusion that there's one particularly crucial missing piece, which I'm going to explain to you. And at the root, most importantly, of this missing piece is the fundamentals of design process. But first, I want to talk to you about a couple of challenges that we have. If you look at the modes of transport that we are familiar with today, railroads, shipping, aviation, the automobile, these industries all started from a different point in history. They've evolved into their own unique cultures, industrial cultures, and their siloed cultures. They're cultures which regard each other suspiciously and as competitors rather than collaborators. They are tired industries. 
and so they're from the 19th century and the 20th century and we're looking at the 21st century our political system is tired and some people would say it's broken which means unfortunately that we are left with 19th century and 20th century infrastructure to deal with and then if we do get a chance to develop a new transportation system, there are lots and lots of different stakeholders involved. There are politicians, there are government agencies, there are engineers, there are lobbyists, just to name a fraction of them. They all squabble, they all have competing agendas. So you only have to look at the, for instance, the High Speed Rail <coughs> Initiative in California to understand how having stakeholders that can't agree on it with each other is very much hindering our progress. And by the way, who is the most important stake of stakeholder of all? It's us, the end user. And when was the last time anybody asked you what your needs and aspirations were for a high-speed connection between Northern and Southern California? What we really need is a grand unifying system of, for both the, for the design of our transportation systems and for the end result. I've been asking myself, what would happen if we design transportation for the future using a collaborative <coughs> process rather than in an exercise of combat? I've been looking at other fields and other industries to see where there might be collaborative processes for coming up with solutions. And it turns out that, that there are. And a really good example is from our friends here at JPL, who use an extreme collaboration process called Team X to design the complex space missions that you've just seen. And they do it repeatedly, and they do it really successfully. I've also looked at the design processes that we use when we're designing and what do, happens if we can expand these processes from just designing products or services or experiences and expand them to designing complex transportation future, uh, systems of the future? Putting all of these things together, I realized that there was this one critical missing piece to developing and remapping our transportation systems, and it is the collaborative process. So I have to explain to you how I believe this process works based on what I've learned from the likes of JPL. Imagine, if you will, a transportation project which is being um, planned by, say, a state or a regional or a city government, city agency. Before this agency even dares to start arguing about whether it's going to include bus rapid transit, or subways, or hyperloops, or whatever it is. What they need to do is to assemble a small team of experts in transportation and related fields, who I will call the core vision team. And the design and designers will be the core of this core vision team. Their task, though, will not be to design the solutions, but it will be to do what designers instinctively do whenever they start a new project and that is to frame up the problem to really establish what the goals of this system are going to be do appropriate future studies so that they can understand what the probable futures are that this system is going to live in and then identify all of the stakeholders that will need to be involved and of course, especially the most important stakeholders, which is us, the end users. And then they're going to establish what the performance standards will be for this system. No solutions, but framing it all up. Their next job will be to identify from around the world or around the country experts to represent each of those stakeholders that they've identified. And these experts have to be highly regarded in their field and they have to have the experience to be able to make extremely important decisions on behalf of their stakeholders that they represent. And I'm going to call this the concept team. 
And the reason that these concept team members are going to have to be able to make important decisions and also under pressure is because they're going to be asked to participate in an extreme collaboration process. This process will be a, about a one-week event where they will be convened and facilitated by an expert moderator. They will be put through an iterative process of intense discussions, intense collaborative processes, breakout sessions, working by themselves very hard, and they each will have a workstation which is highly networked so that everybody can share information and they will have around the walls some smart boards so that they can see the progress they make. And it might sound like a rather chaotic process, but the secret is actually in the, uh, in the moderation. So the beauty of this, if we can design transportation systems using these collaborative processes, we end up with something that we don't have, bef we don't have now. And that is, we get agreement across all of the stakeholders about how the process and how the system is going to work. And once we've got that agreement, uh, we can move forward with everybody agreeing, as opposed to today, where everybody's at each other's throats. I mentioned that this is a huge opportunity for the design community. And here's the reason. The process that I've described is actually the process we use in design every day, but on steroids. So designers need to be all over this process. Also, designers are very good at working across different disciplines. We're good at translating the languages of one discipline to another. Also, designers are very good at visualizing the facts, the data, the ideas, and the concepts that come out of these sessions in a format which the eventual important decision makers can understand, even though they're not subject experts themselves. So what happens if we were able to put these processes into effect? How would that affect my journey to the Bay Area in, say, 2030? Well, in 2030, I believe I won't own a car anymore. Well, at least not my everyday car. Instead, I will subscribe monthly to what I will call a total mobility package. And this total mobility package means that I pay, according to how much I want to pay each month, I receive mobility credits, and I can use these credits to access all of the different transportation requirements I have in a month. So a day before I make my trip to the <coughs> Bay Area, I log on to my total mobility package provider and start mapping out my journey, where I have to be, when I need to get there, my preferred modes of transportation, and of course, when I need to make the return trip. Soon, an itinerary is sent back to me for my approval. I read through it, it looks good, and I accept it. At nine o'clock the next morning, I get a message from my provider to remind me that in 15 minutes time, a car will come to my office and pick me up to take me to the airport. Sure enough, at 9.15, as I get onto the sidewalk, a sleek looking single seat vehicle arrives at the curbside. There is no driver because this car can drive itself. The door slides open and a voice greets me by name and I put my baggage in the space behind the seat. I get in and belt up. Now this vehicle is an object lesson in being the right tool for the job. It's big enough and comfortable enough to take me and my baggage to the airfield, but it's no bigger than it needs to be. It uses no more resources than it has to, no more energy to move me the right tool for the job. Soon we get into the LA traffic, which in 2030 is collaborative because it's largely automated. And we <coughs> s smoothly and silently go to the airport. However, we're not going to LAX this time. We're going to a small local airfield, El Monte, which happens to be close to my office. Threading our way through the traffic is a breeze and I can think about my journey and not the driving. When we arrive at El Monte Airport, the car takes me directly to a waiting air taxi. This air taxi, which is a, ba a battery electric vehicle, also is autonomous. There's no pilot. And there are two passengers already in it waiting to take off. I slip my baggage into the cargo hold. A green light informs me that the weight of the baggage and the position is within the limits. 
I get into the aircraft, join my fellow passengers. The door closes and locks behind me. An aircraft inspector does a last-minute pre-flight check, and then we're on our way, silently cruising up to the runway. A few minutes later, we are airborne, and 30, uh, 90 minutes later, we're over San Francisco, just before we land at another local airfield quite close to my final destination. When I get out of the aircraft, there waiting for me is an automated shuttle sent to me by the company that I'm visiting. I climb in, it greets me, confirms my appointments, and then 15 minutes later, I'm arrived, I've arrived at the corporate campus. This time, I arrive refreshed, relaxed, and ready to do business. And by the way, this journey took just over two and a half hours, whereas in 2015, it took me nearly seven hours. So I believe that if we go from combat and chaos to collaboration and connectivity, we can achieve these seamless kinds of transportation in the future. Now, obviously, I've only been able to touch the tip of the iceberg in explaining this process to you because of time. But I do believe that this crucial missing piece is the solution to our seamless transportation and remapping for the future. And I really appreciate you listening to me. Thank you so much.